Pat, how are you, my friend? Doing fine, doing fine. How are you? I'm I'm good, but I, it looks like we're going to send ten thousand uh, troops and a mission creep over uh, over in the Gulf because of these uh, Iranian threats. Where where are we on that, Pat? Uh, I think the President of the United States. I don't think wants a war with Iran. I don't think the Iranians want a war with the United States. They would be horribly damaged. Many all of their military assets would be destroyed in a major war. But what concerns me is that there are people here and uh, people in the Middle East who do want a war, who do want a conflict, and who believe that's the only way to affect regime change in Iran. And uh, many of the same voices that we heard uh, when we were told that if we simply went up to Baghdad and knocked over Saddam Hussein, then uh, the natural democratic uh, desires of the Iraqi people would be expressed and we would have a new democracy and a Western Western, pro-Western nation there. And none of it worked out because people don't understand the reality of these places. Well, I think, again, the the hot economy that we have, the rising consumer confidence, the uh, generally uh, sunny outlook from uh, businesses mid-sized, small, and large, uh, except for a few soybean uh, interests, I, I don't see why we would want to mess that up by getting involved in some other uh, military conflict in the Middle East. That, that, that's like the surefire way for Trump to lose the election in 2020. Well, it is. It's even worse, I think, for the United States because it would postpone forever, almost forever, us getting out of that region of the world which we had never should, into which we never, should never have plunged ourselves. Under George, uh, George W. Bush, when the, we made that strategic mistake of invading Iraq, occupying Iraq and trying to remake Iraq, and uh, we couldn't do it. And what we did is we destabilized pretty much the entire region with our attack in Iraq and our attempts to to turn Afghanistan into a pro-Western nation and the attack in Libya and getting involved and trying to dump over Assad in Syria and involving ourselves in that war in Yemen, which has turned into a human rights disaster. I mean, Laura, go back to the beginning of this century, and I understand after 9-11, you've got to take down the Taliban if they won't get rid of al-Qaeda. But having done that, your job was pretty much done there. And what did we think we could accomplish by plunging in there? I mean, look at all the suffering and death, and it's something like, I think by Trump's count and others count, others count of $6 trillion in losses. And $6 trillion sunk for what? And while we're all distracted fighting all these wars, democratizing the Middle East, I mean, China grew into a great and mighty power and great rival of the United States, and I think a great antagonist of this country. Well, and look at what we've seen happen to our wealth, our military degraded, our, our men and women who've sacrificed, um, paid the ultimate price, and we find that the trigger effect throughout the Middle East was devastating. I mean, you had the Syrian uh, crisis, you had the refugee crisis, you had the Mubarak out. Of course, what happened in Libya, uh, Benghazi, but the entire uh, Libyan uh, government, uh, radicalism busting out all over. I mean, again, the law of unintended consequences and, and you know, wide-ranging Mark, effects. You know- but let me say, you know, I'm no fan of the Ayatollah's regime at all, and I think they, they detest the United States. They bear a grudge against Hideous. the United States. Yeah. But Iran is not the one that destabilized the Middle East. Two things destabilized it in this century. The first was the Arab Spring, where many of these old iron dictators and generals and others who had been in power a long time were overthrown by the masses in the streets. And the second destabilizer was the massive military intervention of the United States and its allies, allies trying to remake these governments, these regimes, in our own image, when the, the soil was not fertile for democratic, liberal democracy. It, they, they had never known this. And so when you knocked over their present government, they would create new ones which reflected their beliefs and not ours. Well, and I think, again... We look back to 9-11 and that horrible day and the desire for retribution, and, and, and you're right, we had to smash back at the Taliban. But, oh my gosh, I mean, can you imagine if at the time you'd say, okay, we're going to do this, then we're going to go into Iraq, 
And then we're going to lose, like, uh, ultimately, how many people did we lose in Iraq? 5,000, uh, something 5, like that? 5,000 and 2,000 in Afghanistan. Yeah. And then 40,000 wounded. And I don't know how many others have come Marriages destroyed, various suicides. Various problems and social damage and all the rest of it, right. PTSD. But, you know, let me ask you this, Laura. Suppose we had to do it over again, and this were now 2002. And I will say that we launched the American Conservative magazine to try to stop the rush yep. to war that the neocons were pushing Bush and Cheney and all mm -hmm. the rest. But imagine if we had not invaded Iraq. We had not tried to rebuild Afghanistan, but just did the job, got rid of the Taliban, got rid of al-Qaeda. We had not attacked uh, in Libya. We had not gotten involved with the Saudis in Yemen. We had not tried to overthrow the government by aiding rebels in Syria. If we hadn't done any of these things, would be we'd be so horribly worse off than we are today. Which one of them is a success? Well, I completely agree. I mean, this is this. We have to remember, Pat, that the reason I think one of the main reasons that Obama won in two thousand eight, not just because he was a historic first, but because he was against the Iraq War. And, sure, he was the know, one fellow that stood up against it before the war began in the, in the Democratic Party. I mean, there were people standing up against that war by George W. Bush, but unfortunately they didn't succeed. But now we've got some of the same folks who think that we're going to settle the problem if we can change the regime in Iran. And I don't know how you do that, absent an invasion and going up to Tehran and replacing the government, which would take, I saw recently, maybe a million troops to do. And we're not going to do that. Iran is three times the size of Iraq, almost three times the population, a much stronger army, and, you know, much better positioned strategically. And so I don't know, uh, I don't know why we would do it. What benefit are we going to get out of this? What, how does Iran threaten the United States of America right now? Yeah, well, again, uh, I think the the claim is a rising Iran, the Shia um, excesses. Um, we're worried about that. Then why did we – why we were so quick to knock off Saddam Hussein? It was the – <laughs> Most, I mean, Mr. 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 Uh, he fought, a chief he rival. The Iranians for eight years, and we knocked him over, and the Iranians walked in and said, well, "Let's get be friends with the majority Shia here." Yeah. Well, when I was in Iraq in 2006, it, it was when things were getting really bad, and I remember interviewing uh, uh, one of our top military leaders, and I can't remember his name. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on his face, and I can't remember his name. The general, commanding general in Iraq at the time. And he said, uh, I said, well, why is it that all these IEDs I'm, I'm hearing they're being made in Iran? Like all these these IEDs, they have triggers and mechanisms that look Iranian made. And oh, they didn't like that when I asked that question. And it was because Iran was benefiting from the, you know, the destabilization of Iraq and they wanted to have their foothold in there. I'm mean, period. Well, the, I mean, Saddam Hussein was the, he fought in, it was a war of aggression on Saddam's part. But he launched the war against Iran soon after the Iranian, uh, the, the Ayatollah's crowd overthrew the Shah's people and imposed a new regime. He launched that war. It lasted something like eight years. And the, the Iranian casualties were enormous. And for whatever you can say about Saddam, who was a real devil, was a human being and an aggressor, I mean, he was a checkpoint uh, against uh, against the Iranians. And once uh, Saddam went down, who was represented the Sunnis up there in Anbar and the Sunni minority, which controlled the country, and the democracy, the Shia, the more numerous Shia came to power, <laughs> and mm -hmm. their cousins are in Tehran. <laughs> no, so absolutely. Horrible. Meanwhile, Pat, it's we have to... Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, strategic brilliance. <laughs> yeah. And we had all the Mektadr al Sadr. We had all these... All this, this. Now they're all uh, over the parliament. Yeah, now they're now they're like, well, we're uh, so so. We've driven a million Christians out of Iraq. No big deal. It's only their ancestral homeland. They lived in peace and security under the uh, vicious uh, Saddam. I mean, that was the bizarre thing. Remember, he had that uh, Tariq Aziz was his main uh, uh, his his uh, right minister. hand man. Yeah, right hand man. He was uh, a Christian. Yeah, and I, well, that's it. I thought we should have dealt with him because I. Uh, they didn't. Saddam Hussein didn't want a war. Toward the end, he was asked, and almost ready to invite in the CIA. Come in and see for yourselves. We don't have these weapons of mass destruction you're talking about. 
Mm-hmm. And we're told that, you know, they got them all right. They've been meeting with Al-Qaeda in, in Prague, and they've been, they got a, they got a, one of these little Piper Cup type, type planes, which is going to drop all this anthrax on America's East Coast and all this other nonsense. And, you know, it, you know, Colin Powell has a great reputation, but it's been damaged in history by what he had to testify to up at the United Nations. And I got to think he's somewhat ashamed of the role he played in it. No, it was General Casey. I just remembered it. It was General George Casey. That's who I was talking to at the time. It was a great guy, but they were dealt, they were dealt in. But then it was like, the surge. How many times do we hear about the surge, Pat? Oh, the surge. It's successful. We got in there working with the, we're working with the tribal elders. I'm seeing these 21 year old kids, 22 year old kids, second lieutenant, just graduated from West Point. And they're in there trying to negotiate with these elders outside of <laughs> Balad. And I'm thinking, this is just crazy. We don't know. I mean, these are great American, great kids, but they, they, this is not what our military is equipped to do. It's a fighting force. Exactly. I mean, these 19, 20, 21 year old kids, West Point kids are the finest Amazing. soldiers. Some of the finest soldiers in Ever. the world, and they're yeah. dedicated and they're they're brave. But they're not. I mean, they don't can't negotiate with people who've been whose roots are in those lands for <laughs> generations and centuries. Mm-hmm. And who have a way of thinking about how they should govern themselves, and the idea that we're going to start, you know, go over there with our copy of Jefferson's papers and start, you know, preaching and teaching them is absurd. No, Pat, and I, I had really short hair because I had um, my hair was just coming back from uh, from you know chemotherapy and stuff, so I had really really short hair. And I was in really good shape. Like I, I look like I belonged in the military, but I was pretty. Uh, yeah, I, I look pretty, um, you know, d- gender neutral. Let's just say that. And I was happy because a lot of these these Iraqi military folks, and they probably didn't know if I was a man or one, but I, I could see how they were dealing with the women uh, soldiers. And it's just culturally, they didn't like woman. Like, oh, you know, they don't get that. They, they so it just it was very, very difficult. I'm getting way off topic here, but it's very difficult. All right, we got to get into this. So the big Brexit vote, uh, well, of course, happened in 2016. Successful, and everyone thought. It's going to happen. And then, of course, two years later, the elites never wanted to do Brexit. Even Theresa May never really wanted to do it, never couldn't get it done. And now the EU elections, when it looks like it's going to be an, another uh, route of the traditional parties and the globalists in these elections. Well, it's going to be um, very dramatic. I think Nigel Farage in the British end of these elections are in all 28 countries. The elections are in the European Union. I think Nigel Farage is going to come out first, and his Brexit party, which has been in existence, I think, only for about six or eight weeks, I think he's going to come out number one, and he's going to get about two or three times as many votes as the Tories, who I see could come in fourth. And if that happens, and the the Brexit folks do that well, and they are mainly congregated inside the Tory party, I don't know how the Tory party can go for a second referendum and go for undoing the Brexit vote of 2016. I think the Tory party is really uh, is really in, in very dangerous straits right now. I mean, the, the Brexit folks, I think, uh, will not tolerate staying in the EU or another, another referendum, which votes to stay in the, union, in the EU after all they've done. And I think they will walk out of that Tory party, and I don't know what happens to it. You can have that wonderful creature over there in the Labour Party possibly winning an election. Oh, God. Corbyn. What a, a complete disaster. Well, I mean, I mean, Boris Johnson, I think, is... People think he's kind of crazy with his hair and stuff, but he's kind of like the British. <laughs> he's kind of like Trumpian. He got the hair. He got you know. He was the mayor funny, of London. They've had some interesting folks here. Yeah, the hair. They call him the hair of London. Uh, no, he's, but, but he's he eaten. He's very well educated, and I read in a piece just the other day that he's very well spoken and very well educated. And uh, uh, but he is you're right. He's a, he seems to be quite a sort of a character. But I, my guess is, I understand they they say you know after the elections, if May goes down or and resigns, I think then they're going to have to they're going to have to replace her. And the final vote, I think, comes down to some 120,000 Tory party members where Johnson is extremely strong. If he can win a runoff and get into that group uh, or get into that final two, they say he will win it. Um, 
but it really is something. But this whole election, and I think people should look at it closely because Saturday and Sunday there's going to be some big headlines. Huge. I think uh, Marine Le Pen could well defeat the president of France in these elections. Uh, she's got the, what are the Rally for France, I think is the yep. new party of the National Rally, they call it. Oh, you mean the xenophobe? Okay, Pat. I mean, she's, yep. a, and then she's the, a nativist, and, and xenophobe, then, terrible person, you mean. Okay. And then Matteo Salvini, I think it's gonna, his party's gonna run number one in Italy. And he's a very powerful figure now in Europe. They're gonna get this group inside the European Parliament. They're gonna have about one fourth of the seats at the end, I would guess, 170 or so. Yeah. And they're they're not going to be, I mean, it's not an enormously powerful force politically, but the message it sends is that the people, the the center party, center left and center right, are really not addressing the issues that are of most concern to the peoples of Europe, and foremost among these is mass immigration. I know. I keep mentioning Sweden just because I happen to know a lot about it. And because uh, my dear friends who are there who are big socialist, Pat, and they always, <laughs> they're telling me, Every day, you've got to see what's happening in Sweden. Nobody's talking about this. Sweden is moving to uh, to uh, a more uh, prudent, pragmatic immigration. Even the liberal parties are moving against this mi- migration because of the crime and everything that's happened. And you got this. Uh, so you got Sweden um, on the on the cusp here. They they did that weird coalition. If people forget, like in parliamentary systems, it's really hard to do what. Uh, happened in the Brexit vote because you have all these parties. So it's really hard to move um, when the elites all get together. So they have to form these weird coalitions. Uh, and, right. You know, you know, the, you know I, mean, I can recall back just, say, about 19 years ago, at the turn of the uh, century, there was, you know, just several of these new bright populist parties, uh, more authoritarian in nature, outside the mainstream, and people were disparaging it, but you've got them now, as you mentioned, in Sweden. You've got them in Britain. You've got them in France. You've got them in Italy. They're very strong. You've got them in Austria, even though the Austrian thing is a bit of a mess after the weekend. But you had them in Finland. You got them in Finland. You got them in Switzerland. I mean, somebody, somebody. You, when when these things occur, people. I mean, who I don't care what their ideology is, liberal, socialist, whatever. You wake up and say, "What is the matter here? What is happening?" It's like the United States. Why were you so stunned that the American people would rise up and say, you know, the, that middle America's been left behind while all this money is going, you know, is going abroad, and you've got all these folks who don't care about, who call middle America deplorables? And they wonder, my goodness, how did they throw us all out? Well, they had this, how about the India vote? I mean, if we get this... Narendra Modi wins massively. It's a landslide, the Nationalist Hindu Party in, in India. And, and and what happened in Australia? So Scott Morrison wins um, wins the prime ministership, and then they formed some weird coalition. What happened after that? That was the big shock in Australia. Yeah, the conservatives did. I mean, the conservatives carried Australia, but Modi. He's, the uh, I mean, the party of the Hindu the Hindu is the Hindu party, and he's very, if you will, sort of nationalistic, religious, yeah. Yeah. and it, that has enormous appeal. And, and then to an enormous part of that country, I think it's the largest voting bloc in the, or the largest number of, uh, largest electorate in the world when they go to the polls, but Modi seems to be doing well. But you know, this is, uh, it is true, uh, worldwide that, and I will say it, even here you see what's being done to Trump on the Hill and all these subpoenas and things. I think people are coming to say, look, you know, democracy itself, isn't producing what's promised. And look right. at these leaders like Xi Jinping. Look what he did for China in the last 20 years. China With has emerged help. into one of the greatest powers in the world, or the second greatest, certainly. And its future looks bright, even though they've got tremendous problems. So why don't we take a look at that model rather than these models that seem to be failing in Europe and people are rejecting there? Well, the rise of nationalism in China is whipped up by government, you know, the government propaganda. and, and they, It's everybody's... very much ethno-nationalism, yeah. too, and tribalism. Mm-hmm. With the Han Chinese, you see the horrible things done to the Uyghurs. Awful. These are Muslim folks, uh, uh, you know, who really want an East Turkestan carved out of Xinjiang province. Mm-hmm. And the Chinese got uh, somewhere between one and three million you read about. I don't know the exact number that are put into these camps and re-educated and have their Islamic faith, 
you know, sort of drilled out of them and their their ethnic identity drilled out of them and they're to be trained to become, you know, re-education camps to become, you know, just like Han Chinese and have their identity and have their origins orientation toward Beijing rather than who the families and the tribes from which they came. This is uh, this is quite an experiment. I mean, Americans know so little about China. I'm sorry, but it's really complicated. It's a massive, massive power now. And they re- they rose out of poverty mostly because of the United States. I mean, we really, the WTO and most favored sure. nation status, I As mean, I we, mentioned, we got, enriched them. We, we bought $4 trillion more in goods from them than they bought from us. And we all threw open the door, brought them into the WTO, gave them most favored nation treatment, where all the products made in China get easy access to the vast American market. So all these good, loyal American companies say, why not move our factories over there and produce there much more cheaply with fewer regulations and no taxes and no unions and things. Produce there, they make two bucks an hour or something, or a buck an hour and then send the finished products to the United States. Profits will soar, the shareholders will be happy, and all the executives of the company can become, uh, you know, multimillionaires. And we did that for since the early 90s, good old Republican Party, free trade party. And now everybody bemoans the consequences of it, and they said, good Lord, we've got to stand up to China. Who built up China? No, I mean, who did. gave them all that money for all those ships in the South China Sea and those bases? I mean, who's financing the Belt and Road Initiative? It's good old Americans. Well, I got to say, you know what else? I was a very little no, kid. It's a, and I'm a talking disaster. about real little, but I was a. It was during World War II, and you know, but I was three years old to seven. All I could hear about cursing of the people who had sold the scrap metal to Japan that we'd gotten back at Pearl Harbor. Mm. You know, but these guys didn't just sell scrap metal. They moved companies, plants, mm-hmm. technology you know, accommodated whatever the Chinese demanded for the privilege of basing themselves there and getting those low wages and stuff and then sending their stuff to the United States to Walmart, and the money just poured in. Well, and and now they've, you know, now the consequences. Now they're they're saying they're not going to give us rare earth materials necessary for every computer. One of the things of of economic patriotism that, that Hamilton and the others wanted to ensure was, you know, we got to end our dependence on Brit- on the British. We don't make anything here, they found out during the Revolutionary War. We Oops. need the French ships and the French guns and the French uniforms. And Hamilton says, we got to rely on ourselves, you know, for habitation, for defense, uh, for, for, for food, all of these things. we got to make ourselves economically independent of the entire world. And we did. That's why we could stay out of World War I and World War II. And we had no real, no real crises here, and even uh, you know, and, and and we could take defend ourselves and feed ourselves and all the rest of it while the British, you know, a couple of submarines around their islands almost sank them. Pat Buchanan, it is so great to talk to you uh, always. A historical perspective, political perspective, as um, as Nancy Pelosi is almost on a daily basis saying that she's praying for the president and. Hoping there's which hope, way? Hope, <laughs> praying, praying for what That's to happen to him? To tell you a story. Woodrow yeah. Wilson, after he had a stroke, these Republican senators who were trying to kill his League of Nations and his Versailles Treaty came down and said, "We're praying for you, Mr. President." And Wilson said, "Which way, Senator?" <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they wanted a certain. Oh, I just play. We'll just play this for you, Pat, just for good measure. Before we let you go, let's listen to Pelosi just moments ago. So, but the president again stormed out. I think what first pound the table, walk out the door. What next time? Have the TV cameras in there while I have my say. That didn't work for him either. And now this time, another ten- temper tantrum. Uh, um, again, I pray for the President of the United States. I wish that his family or his administration or his staff would have an intervention for the good of the country. Oh. <laughs> Your reaction, <yeah. laughs> Did she, she was a very low voice already, but did she say we got to pray that his family has an intervention for the good yeah. of the country? Yeah. 
I mean, I would like to get some clarification on that. <laughs> yeah, it's called a coup. They're still doing a coup. This time they want the family to do it for them. I mean, well, you it's... know, um, I'm just writing on this today. Is, uh, you know, on what happened and, and what does it mean? And and quite clearly, I mean, Trump is correct if he believes that uh, this is not just oversight, that they want these subpoenas, all these documents for. They clearly want to take him down. And they want to end his presidency, impeach him, and uh, dismiss him in disgrace, and eventually, I think, lead him out of there in handcuffs when he's in the private sector. And the question is, how should the president of the United States react to folks who are doing this? Should he cooperate in any way, or should he fight him with everything he's got, all the powers he's got? And that's my view that I think he's got to do, and I think he's sort of, when you hear yesterday, I think he's come to that conclusion. That this is, you know, a war to the end, and I'm going to fight all the way. Yeah, I think that he, I think that he's doing it the right thing. I first thought, well, maybe he should just sit down with him. But frankly, I didn't like the idea of a two trillion dollar infrastructure package anyway. I mean, why, who we, who's paying for that? I don't think I think McConnell agrees with you. <laughs> yeah, I like what two trillion? Yeah, a, you know, it's an enormous amount of money, exactly. And uh, and where are they going to get? Where are they going to borrow it to do that? Yeah, help the Chinese again, Pat. The, the, the Chinese well, will buy our debt. Build the roads. You got to use American labor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, by, by the way, the the Italians. This is a mistake that Salvini made. They they signed this big deal with China, like a seventeen right. billion dollar deal with China. They're bringing and the, in the Chinese to do the building. Yep, yep. Ukraine just signed some big deal, Belt and Road. See, a lot of these countries are cash strapped after all this globalization. They're pa- they're cash strapped. Uh, because of all this uh, not, and social welfare well, state, they think the, dead, yeah. yeah. Now they think the Chinese are going to help them. Canada tried that. Now they're trying to get, wiggle out of of their relationship with China because of what's happened in Canada. So they're all finding you know, out that there are strings attached with the Chinese. Well, investment. family strings. That's right. The, the, the Chinese Power. build the ports, and and you got you run the ports, and then when you default on your debts, they take over the ports, and they, yeah. uh, they it's the ports belong to them. It's, you That's know, right. it's a sort of quasi-imperial strategy, and it's working. But there has been, I noticed, in Southeast Asia, a reaction, I think, in Malaysia and elsewhere. They say, look, we don't want your money because we know what comes with it if and when we default. You're not going to have the IMF bailing us out. You guys come and take mm-hmm. the port. How do you think uh, Taiwan's feeling right now, Pat? you think they're feeling well, secure? Well, Taiwan is deeply tied to China yep. right now. In terms of trade, uh, China's its number one trade partner. Yep. It's very dependent on 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 China and the um, one of the parties there is is much more interested in independence. Uh, I think it's the old Kuomintang of Chang, which is now much more cozied up to to Beijing than the other party. But I don't think I think if if Taiwan declared independence, uh, that would be a casus belli for Beijing. I don't oh, think I lo- Beijing would let it happen. I love it when you say casus belli. Cause um, uh, spur of war, right? Causes, 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 war, I mean, yeah. Cause of war, yeah. You know, but uh, my daughter's just learning, um, uh, you know, her vocabulary. So we're doing the Latin and the Greek and the bellicose. And what is Bella? And Bella's war. Swearing in Spanish. Oh my gosh, going through all that, Pat. Remember that the old days in the old old Catholic school days, Pat, with the Latin. It really helps yeah, you six, to this day. Six years of Latin, and when we were freshmen in high school, we had it twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Gonzaga! This is the, the Buchanan boys. When they weren't in fist fights, they were doing their Latin drills. That was good. Uh, Pat, we love you. Thank you so much for joining us. We just love okay, having you. Okay, you on. take it easy. Bye bye.